Well, <coughs> when I began to think about Caroline Duffy and Jackie Kay for this talk today, I did what many of you have probably also done. I fled to the computer and started Googling like mad. <coughs> and the result was, I think, an overload of information from articles, interviews for newspapers, special interviews for poetry sites, interviews and readings on YouTube, the British Council website, the websites of the Scottish Poetry Library, the Poetry Foundation, Poets Org from the Amedic American Academy of Poets. And as well as these sources of information, there's lots of explicitly teaching material available too, either freely um, or if you join something. Now this overload means, I think, that the problem may be freeing the poems from informative material rather than attempting to assimilate it. The danger, in other words, is of over-explanation. The teacher's effort must be to manage explication without simplification or banalification. For surely it's important that poetry be sufficiently different, and that might mean sufficiently difficult or even sufficiently inexplicable. Indeed, Paul Selong claims that even to notice what is there is not enough, is not the whole poem, for, he says, not to include the resistance of the incommunicable in the poem is not to write a poem at all. And I want to start by illustrating this by quoting two Scottish women poets on Sylvia Plath. Here is Kate Clanchy. Uh, she's giving an interview to Vicky Bertram for Horizon Review, and it's, it's on the handout. <coughs> she's talking about her need as a poet to be understood. And she pays tribute to her friends and her mentors, <coughs> Carol Ann Duffy, um, who was very important to her, and Simon Armitage. She stresses, too, the importance of Larkin. Larkin, she says, writes about working people, ordinary people. But she also speaks energetically about the influence on her writing of her experience as a schoolteacher. You shouldn't underestimate what a schoolteacher does. Who would? We're certainly constantly nose down against a poem, looking at tiny extracts. The opposite from reading in university, where you try to get an aerial view. People despise teachers as intellectuals. Now, she said it, not, not me. <laughs> But they're generally reading Shakespeare poems, which is more than can be said for most. If you did the metaphysicals for A-level, you probably remember those poems very intimately, close to the bone. I was right down against poems, the way they were constructed, and I think that was probably an influence as well. In my poetry, there's an element of wanting to be very clear, to explain things and say, this is what it's like. That comes very directly from my teaching experience. And if there's an imagined audience for Slattern, that was her first collection, it's probably six formers. I wanted to write poems that were clear enough for them. I become, became fed up with reading Sylvia Plath in school. However much you explain it or look up the references, it still doesn't break down into sense, as Glyn Maxwell would say. This made my students fed up, and I realised it made me rather fed up. I wanted to be clearer than that. And here, on the other hand, is Veronica Forrest Thompson, um, from Glasgow originally, died tragically in 1975 at the age of 27. Um, Edwin Morgan dedicated unfinished poems to her. And here's Veronica Forrest Thompson, then, <coughs> for whom clarity is very often, indeed probably usually, banality and who objects to what she calls bad naturalisation. That's to say, the kind of thing that probably most of us do, analysis of poetry which explains how poets are saying things, or dealing with issues, or engaging with problems. Citing various critical readings of Sylvia Plath's Perta and Lady Lazarus, readings in terms of female resentments and revenge, she says tartly, why she should have bothered to write poems, if this was what she wanted to say, is of course not explained. It is taken to be enough that she was a poet. So in Clanchy's view, if the poem can't be explained to a sixth former, there's something wrong, 
In, <coughs> in Forrest Thompson's, such attempts to explicate risk sidestepping the artifice, the difficulty of the real poem. Now, Caroline Duffy, um, more really than Jackie Kay, has been involved in controversy over popularity on the one hand and avant-gardism on the other, over democracy on the one hand and elitism on the other. After Duffy had been appointed poet laureate, uh, when much of the press was of course more interested in her sexual orientation than her use of language, Geoffrey Hill, in one of his Oxford poetry letters, a lectures, now the notorious Oxford poetry lecture, he did pay attention to the language of her poetry, but in a way which seemed to attack Duffy's accessibility, an accessibility which the difficult and elitist Hill was by his enemies represented as envying. Duffy had, perhaps rather unwisely, suggested that texting was a kind of poetry. And Hill used this as a springboard <coughs> to worry about making poetry too popular, about being too well understood, about making poetry serve the ends of sentiment and relevance that debased its true, timeless and placeless ethical value. These are his words, its true, timeless and placeless ethical value. Poetry, he thought, should be difficult. Difficulty is the true democratic essence of poetry, since it pays the audience the compliment of not speaking down. Tyrants, he has said elsewhere, need to be understood. Tyranny requires simplification, he maintains. Genuinely difficult art is truly <coughs> democratic. Well, poetic quarrels, <coughs> you've probably picked up um, uh, 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 simply by, by going to poetry readings. Poetic quarrels are often very bitter. And it is, I think, to the credit of both poets that a poem by Geoffrey Hill was included in Carol Ann Duffy's Jubilee Lines collection, the, <coughs> the poems uh, specially commissioned for the Queen's Jubilee, where there is <coughs> one poem uh, for every year um, of, of the Queen's reign. Duffy's poem, which I think is absolutely terrific, by the way, um, <coughs> and which concludes the, uh, the collection, uh, The Thames, London, 1912. It, sorry, <laughs> The Thames, London, 2012. <laughs> Her poem begins, History as water, I lie back, remember it all. Hill's poem is called Beyond the Cherubim and it's on the year 1961 and it begins Tigers brush their compunction, sad drummer. Well, <coughs> Duffy, Duffy, of course, seems so right and Hill so willfully obscure. But this seeming so right may perhaps be a curse as well as a blessing. On the back of the Penguin Selected Poems, <coughs> 1994, uh, Sean O'Brien, we have Sean O'Brien saying, so often with Duffy does the reader say, yes, that's it, exactly, that she could well become the representative poet of the present day. But this too might be a problem. Perhaps we should not feel so comfortably that she has read the mind of every Guardian reader and expressed <laughs> it a bit better. <coughs> And so the worry about poetry's availability, I think, does not quite go away. Is it undemocratic to wish to be understood? Should you work, in fact, to free poetry from the public embrace, the book festivals, the poetry readings, the book signings, while still, of course, recognising the need for these if poets are not to starve? Well, Duffy herself spoke of difficulty last month in a Telegraph interview. I think poetry should be difficult, she said. Probably the poetry I find most interesting is difficult. But I also think there's a place for accessibility. It's a broad church, isn't it? I mean, Ted Hughes was very accessible. Betjeman too, of course. Don't quite know what she's saying there, do you? Betjeman too, of course. Whatever, whatever. Carol Ann Duffy and Jackie Kay <coughs> have never annoyed their readers in the way that avant-garde poets 
usually do infuriate potential audiences. Robert Browning, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Wallace Stevens, all baffled and irritated their contemporaries, even though ways of reading them have now been found. In a sense, of course, writers gradually educate their readers. You know, they, they find their readership by, um, <coughs> by encountering them. But it is, is it a failure in Duffy and Kay that they've never annoyed anyone as much as Browning or Eliot or Pound or the language poets, for example? Have they been too accessible, too concerned with audience? Is this even an appropriate question? Well, here then are various positions. It must be rubbish because I can't understand a word of it. It must be really good since I can't understand a word of it. <laughs> it must be really good because it's comprehensible. It's reaching out to me. It must be absolute rubbish because anyone could understand it. Now, these are vulgarizations, but you know the kind of thing I mean, the kind of thing that's hovering about quite a lot when we're reading poetry. And so bearing these questions in mind, I'm, I'm just going to look more closely now at one or two of the, the poems actually on the syllabus, one or two of the poems that you've got to teach, and to ask both what must be said about them and what, if anything, is left over, what can't be fully digested and so may be returned to again and again. What is there beyond the immediate relevance of the poem which turns it into a permanent work of art? Well, originally, um, I, which I haven't put on the sheet because I'm only going to say a couple of things about it, um, but originally is the Duffy poem that's most often invoked when questions of nationality and identity come up. And they usually, of course, do come up uh, for different reasons, of course, but the, the usually questions of nationality and identity do come up with both Duffy and Kay. And my sense that these things have been done to death doesn't mean that they shouldn't remain important to your students. I mean, it's like it's kicking away the ladder, isn't it? Just because they've advanced my career and lots of other people's and we're done with them now doesn't mean that they've seemed to matter. Um, <coughs> they can't, questions of nationality and identity, they can't any more than sentiments and relevance be kept out of the classroom. And there certainly, these are questions that enable comparisons to be made among the poets prescribed, including Liz Lockett, whom I'm <coughs> not talking about today. And they are, of course, the reasons for there being a prescription in the first place. <coughs> and Duffy's take on nationality and origin in this poem seems to me to be a remarkable one. If poetry is memorable words, <coughs> then Duffy's all childhood is emigration. All childhood is emigration is surely poetry. And the words link Duffy not only with Lockhead and Kay, who also think in terms of a kind of emigration from childhood to adulthood, but they link um, Duffy also with Wordsworth, who in his Ode on Intimations of Immortality understands the emigration from childhood, from initial glory to the light of common day, and yet still gives thanks for those first affections, those shadowy recollections, which, be they what they may, are yet the fountain light of all our day. And it links Duffy too with actually her completely favourite poet, her beloved T.S. Eliot um, in Ash Wednesday, where he remembers the earlier life from which he has emigrated and the lost heart stiffens and rejoices in the lost lilac and the lost sea voices, and the weak spirit quickens to rebel for the bent golden rod and the lost sea smell, quickens to recover the cry of quail and the whirling plover. But what's so courageous about Duffy, as opposed actually to Wordsworth and to Eliot, is that she refuses to exploit that nostalgic lyrical impulse that drives Wordsworth and Eliot. She permits in her poem, um, as among the things that are encountered and lost, boys eating worms and swallowing <coughs> slugs. And yet she still manages to get in the obstinate questionings about what is lost. 
And it is, at the end of that poem, I think, a kind of brilliance for such a secular poet, because she is a, a secular poet, she hates the church. Um, it is a kind of brilliance for such a secular poet to so evoke the numinous as she does in her notion of the loss of a river. What has she lost coming from Glasgow? She has lost a river, the loss of a river. <coughs> now, <coughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to move on. I'm going to leave Havisham and Anne Hathaway, which are on the prescription. <coughs> I'm going to leave them with just a few words. Um, I, I, I can see why they might have been chosen. But in a way, the possible reasons for their choice encompass my sense of the limitations of the poems. Havisham has got great energy, but I don't think it flies, flies free of the great expectations pretext on which it feeds. Now, that, I mean, it's, <coughs> it's good for teaching. You can get people to read great expectations, and that's terrific um, in itself. But I think that the poem itself remains too dependent on its pretext. And similarly, Anne Hathaway, um, <coughs> it does have, I think, a, 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 an almost Shakespearean linguistic felicity, but it leans rather too much on that sort of knowing deployment of the second best bed um, that you know, one is, I think, perhaps over familiar with. But at least it, it does provide the opportunity to speak of, of, of Duffy as a love poet. It is, it's a sonnet, it's a, it's a love poem. Um, and of course, it's also good um, for, for, for um, <coughs> a teacher to be able to adduce the Shakespearean echoes and allusions of the poem. <coughs> Now, a war photographer, <coughs> um, which um, I put on the, the sheet. Well, <coughs> there's, as you can imagine, if you haven't already checked, and there's just loads of internet stuff on war photographer. And of course, when you're teaching the poem, you provide the context, the context for Belfast, for Beirut, for, for Phnom Penh. You reference the killing fields, you'll perhaps show the famous photograph of Kim Folk. And so it goes on to Syria and Egypt and the recent dead photographers, Tim Hetherington, Chris Hondras, Mary Colvin. Um, <coughs> they're all available to give us context for the poem. The poem does, however, seem to have a very distinct design on the reader. Not much beneath its descriptive surface is accusation. Even to bear witness, even compassion, is characterizable as self-indulgence or merely a job. There's no escape from implication and guilt. Nevertheless, the linguistic charges of spools of suffering, solution slop and so on, <coughs> are remarkable. And the inventive yet accusatory rhymes <coughs> of the poem are extraordinary feet, heat. <coughs> The evocation of the sacred through the literalization of all flesh is grass, all flesh is grass. The twisting of the negative in its solution, <coughs> comparing it to the writhing of the actual man before he's photographed. The evocation of the sacred, sorry, um, uh, uh, the evocation of the sacred through the literalization of all flesh is grass, again. Um, <coughs> there are allusions in the poem to earlier war poetry. Um, and how the blood stained into foreign dust will, of course, ironically evoke that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. The poem is both artful and angry. But I think what is perhaps most important about the poem is its implicit interrogation of its own art. <coughs> An earlier poem in Standing Female Nude, which is the collection that comes from, is Alphabet for Auden. And that's a kind of angry riff on Auden's Poetry Makes Nothing Happen in his In Memoriam to W.B. Yeats. And War Photographer too questions its own necessity. If poetry makes nothing happen, what's the point of this poem? <coughs> the poet is open. It, it, it's, it's, it's pointless to bear witness if you believe what Auden says, that poetry makes nothing happen. Yet we must bear witness. The poet is thus open to the same questioning as the photographer or the newspaper reader and is thus guiltily implicated. Um, <coughs> the reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. But Caroline Duffy, after all, isn't going to stop bathing or drinking either. So in this way, the poem, I think, subverts its own self-righteousness and it asks 
about the function of poetry and what poetry can do as well as the function of war photography. <coughs> Mrs Midas, which <coughs> is the, <coughs> the last of the Duffy poems that um, I'll talk about. Mrs Midas, um, like <coughs> Anne Hathaway, is from the collection The World's Wife, which is a kind of, if, if you know it well, you know it's an answering back collection. Um, and answering back <coughs> from the female point of view uh, to various um, uh, mythological and historical figures. Um, I've put the, the um, URL of the website on which um, Duffy discusses it at length in an interview with Barry Wood. It's, I mean, despite my opening worries of the, there being far too much material, I think this is indispensable material. This is <coughs> something that you must read. And in this interview, Duffy discusses the rationale for the collection. <coughs> but the danger of this kind of answering back, of course, is that it may become rather mechanical. We get the idea, as it were, and we're insufficiently challenged. You know, we kind of take the point. <coughs> um, at worst, we get, and, and she herself admits that um, all reviews that didn't particularly like the collection um, homed in um, both on the, um, the Darwin poem uh, where Darwin's with his wife at the zoo and, and the wife says, you know, that it reminds me a bit of you. Um, <coughs> and that's it. Um, or the not very good joke of Mrs. Icarus. Um, I'm not the first or the last to stand on a hillock watching the man she married prove to the world he's a total, utter, absolute grade A pillock. Um, <coughs> well, I mean, it's very funny, but uh, it, it hardly meets the difficulty criterion. <laughs> um, but, but this is, I mean, Carol Ann Duffy knows that. She knows that these are, are squibs. <coughs> um, but it does seem as though on the face of it, it's possible to explain Mrs. Midas, to kind of empty it out. Um, <coughs> certainly, it is, I think, a wonderfully witty poem. It's, it's exploitation of cliché and pun. Uh, it's really funny. Um, <coughs> the toilet, I didn't mind. You know, the notion that you're sitting on the golden throne. Um, <laughs> uh, if Mr. Midas is your husband, I think it's beautifully done. And the grasp of, of speech rhythms um, is, is, um, is, really, uh, is, is really remarkable. Um <coughs> Look, we all have wishes granted, but who has wishes granted? Um, and she remarks that too in the interview as, as, as picking up the kind of idiom of her grandmother, you know, that's the way she spoke, you know. Oh, we've all got wishes granted, you know, but who has wishes granted? You know? <laughs> uh, and this is, I, I think this is all terrific. But um, at the same time, I think in the end, the poem is greater and actually more mysterious than all this suggests. It's, it seems as though there's a poem we could grasp. <laughs> But I don't think the poem is just offering um, <coughs> the good advice not to marry a banker or a wanker. <coughs> <laughs> when all the explanations are over, um, when you've explained the field of the cloth of gold, the allusions to Shakespeare and T.S. Eliot, the chair she sat in like a burnished throne and so on, when you've turned the myth inside out, when the relevance has been debated, when the feminist payback, as it were, has been paid, when the loss and no gain has been weighed up, when the real tenderness that, uh, that seeps out, I think, at the poem's um, conclusion, I miss most even now his hands, his warm hands on my skin, his touch. You know, this, <coughs> this real tenderness that is there in this kind of sharp, edgy poem. Um, <coughs> but even once you've gone through all that, it seems to me there still remains the something unexplained, the mystery that makes it worthwhile to have written the poem. For down in that glade, in the caravan, an unfixed house, which still has the potential to travel, is Midas. Thin, delirious, hearing, he said, the music of Pan from the woods. And he asks his wife to listen, but she cannot hear the music of the god. So who in the end is more like the poet? Mrs. Midas, uttering the age-old female complaints about the selfishness of her man, his lack of thought for me, or Midas, alone with his miraculous startling transformations, a golden trout, the lemon mistake of a golden hair. His touch is deathly beautiful, but like the power of poetry, it may enable congress with the divine. And so in this way, I think Caroline Duffy is able to enlist the ancient myth 
to investigate modern emotional and social states, while reserving, in the end, the right to suggest that there's another story still to be told about Midas, beyond the myth and beyond its rewriting, its reapplication. There is, in certain lights, and that's a beautifully packed phrase, I think, still life, a bowl of apples, whose meaning cannot be completely emptied out. Well, <coughs> it will be clear from this reading that the strategy of my talk today is to contend that much of the accessible poetry of Caroline Duffy turns out to be difficult after all. Its democratic method is to provide access so that we're lured in, only to find ourselves not in a wholly comprehensible space, but rather in a maze as confusing as it is captivating. <clears throat> and I'm also suggesting that this is what makes Duffy's poetry more than of its time, however contemporary it may feel. And I think it happens because Duffy cannot stop thinking about the nature of poetry itself. Such thoughts, and she uses this expression, are in her poetic DNA, are in her poetic DNA. <clears throat> Now, I can't quite repeat this method, I think, with Jackie Kay. This is partly because the chosen poems from her work do seem to me to have been chosen precisely because they are teachable in fairly straightforward ways. I think, uh, I think they're uh, to be taught at an earlier stage anyway, uh, the, these poems. Um, <coughs> uh, it's not that they don't work. They do, I think. I mean, Gap Year, for example, just melts my heart because I too love my son and he too has travelled in distant lands. Um, <coughs> and, you know, the, the pun on the Gap Year, I think, is, is, is very moving. But I'm struggling to find in it quite that compulsion to write a poem or that tussle with words that is in other of Jackie Kay's poems and indeed in most of her prose, which I think is wonderful. The Chosen Kay poems are full of generous sentiments of proper outrage at suffering and proper celebration of courage. And if the poems have designs on their readers, as in Divorce, for example, which um, imagines a youthful audience in any case, it's from one of her collections for younger people, um, <coughs> it's impossible to quarrel with the worthiness of the designs. But perhaps we should be left occasionally in more doubt about how to respond. There's no question, for example, of wondering about the relative worth of the grandmother and the posh woman in my grandmother's houses. Uh, <coughs> the posh woman says to the grandmother, you just get back to your work. Well, maybe, but I just want to say, no, she didn't say that. <laughs> no, that's, that's not what she would have said. The values are too cut and dried. Um, I might instead have chosen my grandmother, um, which probably inspired by the grandmother of her birth mother, uh, which offers much less comfortable reading um, and much more ambivalent response to the grandmother, the woman. But in spite of my complaint here, Jackie Kay's poetry is, I think, generally remarkable for its emotional authenticity. And that's because in her best poems, Jackie Kay allows her speakers to be mysteries to themselves. And I think she differs from Caroline Duffy in this. Duffy's speakers, and this is especially true in The World's Wife, understand themselves all too well because Duffy has wholly anatomatized them. But the old woman in Kay's bed, for example, doesn't know what her real feelings are. At the very end, she's strange to herself. Know that <coughs> I'm saying I want her to be guilty. Know that I'm saying I'm no grateful but she doesn't know whether she's grateful or not. Um, she remains uh, strange to herself. Keeping orchids <coughs> has some of the, the cool anger that informs my grandmother. But its speaker, like the old woman in bed, doesn't know what her real feelings are. Lucas Aid, too, refuses to be cut and dried. The poem has an almost ethereal air at its close, which conveys, without emptying them out, the mysteries of life and death. Both poems have, I think, transfiguring endings that open up possibilities, so that initial accessibility is a prelude to a kind of lift-off, as it were, a prelude to endings 
that refused to be completely explainable. <coughs> Boiling water makes flowers live longer. So does cutting the stems with a sharp knife. The cold violence yet ambivalence of the speaker's response is brilliantly condensed into these two lines. Two surprising, contradictory, yet true ways of preserving beautiful living things converge, leaving speaker and readers together in a complex of feelings about self, inheritance, love and resentment that resonates well beyond the situation that gives rise to them. <coughs> and finally, Lucasade. Uh, Lucasade is from Off Colour, uh, which is, I think, my favourite Jackie Kay um, collection. And the poem has Kay's hallmark humour. Um, here, um, a kind of loving wit that delightfully catches the mother's own unself-pitying funniness as she rejects the traditional markers of illness, so beautifully condensed into that lucasade which never made any of us well. <coughs> <laughs> the last lines of the poem lift the mother and with her our understanding of life and death to another plane, while refusing to be straightforwardly uplifting. <coughs> There's no promise beyond the moment and its memory. Yet the last view of the mother is brilliantly given as simultaneously unforgettable and irrecoverable. <coughs> My mother, on her high hospital bed, waves back. Her face is light and radiant, dandelion hours. Her sheets billow and whirl. She is beautiful. Next to her, the empty table is divine. Well, I thought at first divine was a mistake, was too leading in its suggestion of elevation. But I think it glances back to the language of women's magazines and corrects it with a better vision of divine than magazine approval of coffee tables and women's dimensions. I'm sure, however, <coughs> that dandelion ours is quite extraordinary. It's inexhaustible. We can return to it again and again without, as it were, emptying out that evocative <laughs> We tell the time in a most gentle and picturesque way when we blow a dandelion clock. When we dissipated the clock, we cannot make it return. Yet in the poem, it signals a release from earthly trammels that becomes a cause not for mourning, but for celebration which transforms the sticky nostalgia of Lucasade into the evocative memory of an old song. Thanks very much.